My name is Jack Mayer, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's panel. I am a vice president with Booz Allen and Hamilton, and I lead the firm's homeland security business. So I have an intimate relationship with the department in terms of uh, immigration reform, the topic of today's conversation. As you know, immigration reform has been a topic of significant discussion over the past several years, but it took on even more importance after 9-11. In establishing the Department of Homeland Security, the Congress tried to fix some of the deficiencies in our immigration system by separating immigration enforcement mission from the immigration process mission. They did this through structural change, creating separate agencies within the new department to deal with each mission. But the Congress did not address the major policy issues associated with immigration reform. The Obama administration has made immigration reform one of its highest agenda items. And Senator Schumer, as chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee, has indicated that he will introduce immigration reform legislation later in this year. I am joined today by three distinguished gentlemen who will discuss immigration reform from the historical economic, and operational perspectives. David Kennedy is the Donald J. McLaughlin Professor of History at Stanford University and Director of the Center for the Study of North American West. He has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize in History for his book, Freedom from Fear, The American People in Depression and War, 1929 to 1945. Alan Greenspan is the president of Greenspan Associates, LLC. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005. He has served five presidents of the United States, initially with President Ford when he became chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and as chairman of the Federal Reserve under Presidents Reagan, Bush, Clinton, and Bush too. And Alex Alinikoff is Dean of the U Georgetown University Law Center. He serves as co-chair of the Immigration Policy Revitalization Service. Gentlemen, I'd like to start by asking each of you to comment on the necessity of immigration reform in America from your perspective. David, would you start us off? Well, thanks, Jack. I I'm going to take uh, my brief here to be to set a little do a little historical stage setting about some of the, the background of the whole immigration issue, which is not just one of the many stories in the American historical narrative. In some ways, it is the core of the whole business. Uh, broadly speaking, I'd say there have been three stages or phases uh, in American immigration history. The, from the founding until uh, about 1914, the outbreak of World War I, uh, there was unrestricted immigration to this country, no numerical caps of any kind. Uh, that's formally legislated in 1924 when we introduce uh, a, a formal numerical cap. Uh, but that period saw the migration of about 35 million Europeans and several hundred thousand Asians to the United States. And it's, uh, as it were, uh, backloaded. That is to say, most of that immigration arrived in the two decades or so around uh, the either side of 1900 when approximately 25 million people arrived between 1885 and the outbreak of World War I in 1914. The census of 1910, which falls right in that period, of course, uh, records the highest percentage of foreign-born people ever resident in the United States. Uh, it's 14.7%. Uh, and at that time, the United States accounted for nearly half of all global international migration. Of all people who crossed international borders to relocate themselves in that era, uh, nearly half came to the United States. And of that great migratory stream, something that's forgotten largely in our uh, historical, collective historical national memory, of that great stream of mostly Europeans uh, that came in that period, about 44% of them went home again, which is a, quite a strong cautionary note about taking too literally uh, the self-congratulatory national narrative that we all learned in school about the only thing that made these people move in the first place was the beacon of American liberty, democracy, opportunity, and so on. Uh, nearly half of them found those factors insufficiently attractive to hold them <laughs> in the country and eventually returned to their homelands. Uh, beginning approximately the outbreak of uh, World War I in 1914, down to uh, 
uh, the time of a major legislative change in 1965 and the whole legal regimen governing immigration, in that period, the 30 years or so, a long generational period, uh, there was very little immigration, uh, largely because of the two world wars, the Great Depression, and then, as I say, the legislative uh, affirmation of those facts, in a sense, in the notorious National Origins Act of 1924. So that in the census of 1970, we see just about the lowest percentage of foreign-born people in the United States ever. It's in the 5% range. And that period, that long pre- and post-World War II period, uh, is what is resident in a lot of our memories as what ought to be the model kind of social setting in which immigration happens and in which assimilation happens. But the fact is that's a period in which there is very little actual immigration. So that doesn't serve us very well, actually, as a a historical benchmark as to what might be relevant today. The third big phase of our country's immigration history, of course, is it covers the last four decades and extends right down to the moment in which we're speaking and thinking about it this afternoon. Uh, since the, uh, the immigration laws were overhauled in the Johnson administration in 1965, uh, some uh, nearly 40 million people about have come to the United States. Uh, there's about 36 million foreign-born people in the United States today. That's actually, as a percentage of the overall population, somewhat less uh, than was the case in 1910. It's about, we're about 13% foreign-born today. Uh, and again, if we measure our experience against the world's, uh, we're a much smaller part of the whole global phenomenon of human migration than we were 100 years ago. Uh, the United Nations tells us that about 200 million people today live outside their country of origin. 36 million are in the United States. So today we account for about 18% of global migration when it was well over 40% uh, 100 years ago. It's also worth noting, I think, in this context that uh, though we're now at about 13% foreign born in this country, Canada is 19%, Australia is 24%. So relative to countries we might care to compare ourselves with, relative to the global experience of migration, relative to our own history, uh, we actually have a slightly lesser degree of immigration on our hands, you might say, than has been the case in other settings. All right, I, I was given the brief earlier to try, say a little something about what's the same and what's different or what's comparable and what's not comparable about today's situation. I think this kind of thing will probably consume much of our discussion, so let me just hit a few things very briefly. Uh, the causes of migration globally today are quite similar, actually, to what was happening a century or more ago. Uh, most migrants come from areas that are being convulsed usually by the early stages of some version or other of the Industrial Revolution, which has the demographic effect of shaking people loose from traditional ways of life, putting them in search of alternative ways of life. Many of those people migrate out of their country of origin, and that's, what, that's the big engine that drives immigration. In fact, there's, there's a Roman saying in Latin, it goes back to Roman times, about why people migrate. It's a very simple saying. It says, ubi est pane. E.B. est patria. And for those of you who didn't go to Jesuit school as I did, that means where there is bread, there is my country. And that, that pretty, pretty well sums up the, the basic motivational matrix for most uh, immigration. So that's one thing that's fairly constant, I think. Uh, it's also, r roughly speaking, the incidence of, of immigrant presence in our population today is kind of comparable to what it was 100 years ago, actually a little bit less, but more or less in a comparable range. So in these matters, we're in kind of familiar territory. Uh, what's different, I think, are, I would say four things are different from today, between today's situation and what obtained a century or so ago. Uh, one is the nature of the economy is different, and which is, raises all kinds of questions about the prospects for labor mobility for immigrants who come here with skill sets that don't really offer much prospect for uh, occupational and social mobility in an economy that has much less use for unskilled labor or semi-skilled labor than was the case of an industrial uh, assembly line kinds of economies 100 years ago. Uh, the second difference between now and then is in the fiscal realm, uh, that governments at all levels today uh, by statute and uh, obligation provide more social services uh, than was the case 100 years ago, and that raises the, the, the perceived and measurable fiscal costs of immigration in ways that really weren't very visible uh, a century or so ago. Uh, the third thing that's different, of course, is that we now receive immigrants, a, a disproportionate share of immigrants from a single country, Mexico, uh, with a unified national culture, and it's uh, immediately available across a relatively permeable land frontier. There is no precedent for that in American history. Uh, before uh, 
uh, the current moment. That is to say, an immigrant group that came from such a, a single, coherent cultural source, settled more or less in a, a major region of the United States, had its mother culture so available electronically and otherwise uh, right next door, and holds out the prospect, at least, or the possibility of the creation in the United States of a kind of Chicano Quebec, that is to say, a group that might have greater capacity to preserve its cultural patrimony intact than most prior immigrant groups had. And the fourth thing that's different today from 100 years ago, uh, and I'm sure this will be the subject of further discussion, is the presence of so-called illegals uh, in the immigrant population. Something in the order of a third of all immigrants are illegal or undocumented. Their illegality is an artifact of the 1924 legislation. Uh, there was really no such thing as an illegal immigrant for all practical purposes until we put that numerical cap on in 1924. Uh, my great-great-grandmother walked from Halifax to Brooklyn and established our family in the United States. Uh, was she legal or illegal? The question never came up. Nobody ever asked her. She was healthy and didn't have a criminal record. That's all you had to be. Again, at least we didn't, as far as we know, she didn't have a criminal record. <laughs> Uh, but, but the illegal situation today is one that vastly complicates the, the political and the fiscal and the cultural question, and I'm going to leave that to my colleagues to flesh that out. Thanks. So, Alan, is there an economic imperative for uh, immigration reform? Oh, indeed there is. Uh, and the reason, essentially, is that we keep thinking of immigration reform in terms of a single set of problems. It is not. In fact, it's really two fundamentally different types of problems. And the first is the one that David raised, namely that uh, we have this extraordinary concentration on the lower end of skills in the United States uh, with very substantial participation by so-called illegals who make up the very large part of what amounts to the number of people in the United States with less than a high school diploma. And uh, it's, uh, there are almost as many uh, uh, native-born, I should say, almost as many illegals as native-born in that very rapidly declining aspect of the American labor force. And clearly, the focus of solving that problem is a very different issue from the second problem, which is in fact far more important for the longer term health of the American economy. And that is the deprivation of skilled workforces to essentially staff our ever increasingly sophisticated capital stock. Uh, we have uh, an extraordinarily complex system uh, for producing goods and services in this country and it's evolving over the years at a pace which our primary and secondary school systems have proved inadequate to cope with. The result of this is that we are getting very major pressure coming to import people, import various different skills, so that the combination of these two aspects of the immigration problem creates a very unusual configuration of where the foreign-born people lie on the skills staff, on the skills scale. There's a very large proportion, in, as I mentioned before, in the less, lesser skilled, and an extraordinarily heavy concentration in the very upper skills. 40% of our science PhDs are foreign-born. And for all of you who have been involved with Silicon Valley in one form or another, a remarkably large number of the entrepreneurs there, and indeed the staff, are foreign born. And if you look down all of the specialties that appear in our labor forces, a remarkably large proportion are foreign born. Now this is partly an indictment of our school system, and indeed, uh, the really ultimate, the, the ultimate solution to this problem has got to be that we solve the problems with which I'm sure you're all aware in primary, secondary education and create the skills of the resident born, the native born 
population to be able to do the types of things that are required. So uh, the policies that are associated with those two things, two different aspects of uh, the immigration problem uh, are really very different. And I'm fearful that the essential focus of everything is on the issue one of illegals and of the broader issues that relate to uh, the laws of the land and the like without focusing on the fact that what we really need to do is find a way, assuming that our education system cannot get up to speed sufficiently quickly, we've got to find a way to vastly increase the amount of skilled professionals being allowed into this country. Because if we fail to do that, we are going to find that the productive structure of this economy, which has so far led the rest of the world throughout almost all of our history, that structure is going to get, become undermined and we're going to have a very considerable difficulty in reestablishing American hegemony if we fail in that area. Alex? So, Alex, in order to get immigration reform, we have to change the laws. And uh, you, among the th four of us up here, are the only one who's actually been inside the government actually doing this and trying to operationalize the immigration laws in this country. From an operational perspective, is there an imperative for immigration reform? Yeah, I think there is. Let, let me start by saying, we, you know, for all the problems, we still, uh, we're still a nation of immigrants. Almost a million people a year get green cards in the United States. Several hundred thousand people a year naturalize. Uh, the United States accepts more refugees for permanent resettlement than any other country in the world. But having said that, the system is basically broken. And you've heard some of the reasons from both uh, David uh, and Alan. We've got an undocumented population of 10 to 12 million people uh, in this country. Uh, we have a, a, a system put in place in 1986 that was supposed to create enforcement at the work site that is uh, totally, uh, has totally failed. There's no deterrent at the work site for hiring undocumented uh, immigrants. And on the legal side, as Alan just said, uh, we have an ossified system of categories for admitting skilled labor uh, that go back many years and are not flexible, are not uh, attuned to the needs of the, of the society. Uh, and we face on the family side long backlogs. So we have people separated from spouses and minor children for three or four or five years before they can come in. Brothers and sisters in some countries go back 15, 20 year uh, waits before they can come in. So both on the legal side and the enforcement side, they're just enormous problems that, uh, uh, that need to be fixed. Now, we tried this a couple of years ago. We, we thought we had a pretty good shot at it. We had a Republican president and a Democratic Congress in favor of comprehensive reform. That was the phrase used, comprehensive immigration reform. And it failed. I think it failed for many reasons, but let me just highlight uh, three. The first was there was very strong opposition from the right as to the legalization part of the bill. The bill would have provided status for many or most of the undocumented immigrants uh, in the country. This was called an amnesty, and the phone lines of Congress were jammed by people calling to say these, these folks are lawbreakers, they don't deserve status here, they should go home and then maybe come back at some future point. There was a very strong concentrated effort to oppose the bill for giving so-called amnesty to people. The second was that even the advocates were split a bit on the bill. There was a, a part of the bill that had a substantial guest worker program, and the, the numbers got up to about 400,000 people a year that would come in to work on the low-skilled side, as Alan uh, talked about. And this was needed, it was said, because industry needed, business needed the unskilled workers. These were jobs that Americans wouldn't do. Uh, and secondly, because one thought you couldn't solve the problem of undocumented migration unless there was a way to let in folks for whom, who wanted to come, for whom there was ultimate, for there was uh, demand for. So this was seen as an important part of the program. But this split the left for the bill because there were a number of strong labor unions, AFL, CIA, AFL-CIO who were strongly opposed to a significant guest worker program, even though the advocacy groups, the immigrant advocacy groups were in favor of it. And then the third thing I think was it was, the, there was this is what I think supposedly Winston Churchill once said about rice pudding, that it, it lacked a theme. Uh, and the, the, um, the, the bill lacked a theme. There wasn't a narrative, there wasn't a way of talking about why we were passing this legislation, except that a bunch of people wanted it for different reasons. 
Uh, and so there was no strong message to the American people to get behind comprehensive reform. So the bill went down, and people thought it'd be dead for a while. Well, now we've got a, some changed circumstances. I'll just take a minute or two to talk about that, and we can talk about elements of the uh, proposals down the line. Now we've got, a, a, obviously, a, a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president more interested in passing uh, the legislation. We have a recognition of the importance of the Latino vote. Uh, in the last election, which is strongly in favor of, uh, of a passage of a comprehensive immigration reform. And we have an economic crisis. A and that cuts two ways. On the one hand, it may be very difficult to talk about legalizing 10 to 12 million undocumented workers in a time where the unemployment rate is approaching 10%. On the other hand, because of the uh, economic crisis, the level of undocumented migration into the country has dropped dramatically. Apprehensions at the southwest border are down about 20% or so. So in some ways, that problem uh, may have eased. How those all, all those factors play together, we'll have to see uh, going forward. But the need for legislation uh, is clear to me. So if we understand that there is this imperative, um, there remain quite a few obstacles in order to get anything through. Is getting something through um, during the next four years possible? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, the, the president announced uh, and has kept to this promise that he would start the debate on immigration this year. He met with uh, uh, 20 or 30 members of Congress just uh, last week to start the discussion uh, going. Uh, it's, as everyone in this room knows, it's a very full legislative plate at the moment, and whether this will be, uh, this will be brought up in, the, in Congress this year or next is, is unclear. Senator Schumer, who is the, the new uh, chair of the subcommittee that will uh, bring the immigration legislation forward, has made a very strong statement that he intends to introduce and push for legislation, has a very strong description of the legislation, the pro how he would uh, talk about it and, and push it. Harry Reid has talked about passing legislation. So the, there seems to be an interest in moving this forward over the next year or two, but uh, predictions are dangerous here. It's, it's whatever it's worth, the, if you think of the major pieces of legislation that have affected this whole picture over the last century or so, the notorious 1924 National Origins Act did in fact pass in a context of great national trauma and a very sharp recession just preceding 1921-22. And many historians who have examined that have thought that if that legislation had been delayed or deferred even a year or two later, and there was a, in the context of 20s prosperity, it might not have been as restrictive. And inversely, the 65 legisl 1965 legislation, which ends the national quota, uh, origins quota system, and is generally thought to be a more liberal law, happens in the context of 60s prosperity. So there is some rough correlation. The N is rather small here, I understand, but there is some correlation between the, the economic and social context in which legislation takes place and what result you get. So if we legislate in the midst of this economic crisis, the, the prediction would be we'd get a somewhat more restrictive bill than otherwise. I think I'm getting a little more optimistic, uh, largely because the major thrust against immigration was the fact that immigrants would lower the wage levels of American workers. And I think that the body of opinion that is developing in the academic community is beginning to gradually refute that. And the reason for that is that there is some evidence that the very substantial amount of illegal, undocumented, lower skilled workers are affecting the wage rates of native-born, uh, lesser skilled workers. But that share of our economy is falling fairly dramatically. And so that what actually is the case is that we need all of these people. Uh, the actual, I think the civilian labor force for all undocumented uh, uh, laborers is uh, approximately it's roughly seven million. It's not, a, it's not an official figure, but that's the number that a lot of people are using. And if we endeavored to try to move those people out of the United States, the impact on the economy would really be devastating. So my view is I should think that uh, we're going to get a lessening in the opposition and the clear need for specifically in the skilled area 
is going to emerge, and I think in a positive direction. There was a, a National Academy of Sciences study of this. Now it's nearly 10 years ago. Uh, there may be, maybe, Alex, you might know about an update to it. I don't. But uh, in any case, its finding was that the, was, the methodology is highly debatable in this, but the conclusion was that the, the net effect of the immigrant presence in the economy and society as a whole, as consumers, as workers, taxpayers, and so on and so forth, what the sign was positive, it was plus $10 billion a year. Big absolute number, but in a 12, 13, 14 trillion dollar economy, it's actually loose change. And even if the sign had been negative, it wouldn't have made an awfully big difference. Uh, so there's not, there's not a strong argument, at least on the basis of that study, to be made uh, on, on that basis. Yeah, I, you know, there's another, real, there's another reason that I've been pushing with very little success on the question of why we should focus on the issue of skilled. Most of the people in this room, and most of the people whom I know, are being subsidized by the immigration laws in the sense we are keeping out our competition. And it invariably, since it's a real, it's competition, it is not uh, basically uh, the, the uh, different types of, of uh, immigration. This is real pressures uh, on the level of high income wages. Since we're all, I should hope, been most concerned about the ever increasing state of the uh, concentration of income in this country, that there are two ways of getting that change. One is you lower the bottom level, or two, you lower the upper level. And I think uh, people don't realize this. But that does have an effect as far as history is concerned. And if we could get a sufficiently large number of skilled workers, not only will we resolve our problem with respect to the productive capacity of our system, but I also think we have a very significant increase in social comedy as a consequence of that. You know, but I've, I've heard both uh just to take this discussion to a slightly different territory. I, I've heard both uh, President George W. Bush and President Obama say that the, the valence of the immigration, the political valence of the immigration issue surprised them, that they really weren't prepared for the, the depth uh, of emotion that uh, invests this subject when they touch it uh, politically. Uh, and that, that's another whole domain of this, that uh, we, we, this discussion excites uh, emotional responses that there are wholly detached from the kind of cool analytic perspectives we're trying to offer here. And uh, Alex, I'd be particularly interested in your perspective, how, how you think that factor complicates well, the, the prospects for meaningful, cogent legislation. I think you're, you're right, and I think this is really, the, the, the anti-amnesty claim was a very strong, very, very powerful one. I think the way the proponents of legislation now are thinking about this is uh, the following. They, they've done some polling, and they, 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 seem, they seem to have discovered the following findings, that, that most Americans think that undocumented immigrants come as undocumented immigrants because they choose not to come as legal immigrants, which they could do, because they want to avoid paying taxes, which is a very peculiar view of the facts, but it seems to be a strong strain in American popular opinion. Because of this, pe some people have started talking, uh, Senator Schumer in a recent speech said exactly this, is that the legalization proposal should be a mandatory legalization proposal. That is that Congress should adopt law, a law saying people must legalize if they're here undo in an undocumented status and start paying their taxes. Well, a lot of these folks are paying taxes. They're paying either payroll taxes because they're, they're employed in the usual uh, system or they're paying real estate, uh, real estate taxes, property taxes, um, sales taxes, and the like. But the view is that if, if you make legalization mandatory, then you, can, you actually fold legalization into a law enforcement strategy rather than you know, giving something away for free. And so it's also been a part and parcel with a, a pretty tough set of conditions. You'll have to pay a substantial fine. You'll have to learn English. You'll have to learn civics. 
and the idea is to, is to, is to undercut uh, the claim uh, of amnesty. You, you, you wrote a very interesting op-ed piece back in April, which I found quite interesting. I, I didn't even ask him to say that. So <laughs> <laughs> you did subliminally. Okay. Uh, but you raised, you raised a very interesting question of the technology of how to go about this. And uh, you were discussing the, the ability of constructing electronic mechanisms uh, which would actually make it feasible to know whether a particular worker or application was uh, documented or undocumented. And uh, it had certain problems too, and I think it would be interesting to uh, could go over the details of that. Especially, I love your 99% oh, okay. error issue. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'll say a word about this. So, in, let me take a step back. In 1986, Congress uh, passed what were called employer sanctions, meaning that an employer would be sanctioned if he or she hired an undocumented immigrant. But there was resistance to any kind of national identity card in the country. So the way you prove you are able to work is you show um, a driver's license and a social security card. And immediately there was this massive market in fraudulent documents. So there really, there are very few undocumented immigrants in the United States. There are many falsely documented. <laughs> I say that seriously. I mean, it, it, on any street corner in any city in the United States, you can buy documents that look good enough to get past employers who, after all, aren't immigration officials who can know whether or not what they're looking at is accurate information. To make up for this, Congress then, a few years later, adopted a set of pilot projects that would uh, electronically verify documents. So people would come in uh, and the, they would show their cards and then a, a query would go to the Social Security uh, information and also to Department of Homeland Security information. Um, and a, a, a thousands of employers now have signed up. It's still a small percentage of the overall workforce, but many, many people um, use this. Th there are two problems with it, both on the false negative and the false positive side. So these uh, federal records are not perfect. People, when their n names go into the system, they get reversed. Uh, foreign names are often difficult for people to put into the system. And so you will often get back a query, I should say often, but you you'll get back sometimes a query that says, no, this person is not authorized to work, when in fact they are authorized to work. The other problem is that people can use, can borrow somebody else's cards, which are valid cards, pretend they're somebody else, and they'll go through the system with flying colors with accurate information. So when a raid was done at a major um, Iowa meatpacking plant that had used this system, they nonetheless found thousands of undocumented workers who had used other people's valid cards to beat the system. So what do you do about that? Well, you can't, you're not gonna get comprehensive immigration form passed unless people think you've really got an enforcement system in place if you're gonna legalize 10 million aliens so you won't be back five years from now saying and you know, legalize the five million that just came in over the last, last few years to beat the system. So that will require some credible worksite enforcement. But that requires some kind of, first of all, of, of really uh, curing the databases of errors. And then some kind of probably biometric identifier, whether it's a retinal scan or a fingerprint or something that will be able to be checked to make sure you are the person who say you, you say you are. And that scares Americans. It can be expensive to work that out, so it's a difficult problem. In the current situation, the, the number Alan was pointing to, it, imagine a workforce of what, about 150 million Americans? Slightly more. Slightly, more. okay. And, if, and people change jobs, used to change jobs until the current recession once every three or four years on average. So you may have had 30 or 40 million new hires a year. If all those people are run through the system and you have an error rate even of just half a percent, you've got hundreds of thousands of people who are being wrongfully denied jobs because of errors in the system. So everybody sort of knows we need a solid verification system to show we have enforcement in order to justify legalization that will get comprehensive immigration reform through the Congress. But we don't have the systems yet to do that. And the Department of Homeland Security now says, oh no, e this system which they call E-Verify works, it's close enough, it gets most of it right, we can just you know, take this and scale it up, but, but I'm quite skeptical of the ability to do that. Great. Uh, I just wanted to add something, can I, or not? Sure. Quickly. Well, <laughs> I want to open it up to the audience okay. to be able well, to. Well, just, I mean, what, what this discussion has just pointed to is the, the viability or lack of viability of using the, the point of employment as the point where you police and uh, bring order to the system. Of course, the other point where a lot of resources have been directed is the border. Uh, and I know Jack has been involved in some of the business of uh, increasing border security and border sealing the border and 
building the fence and so on and so forth. There's two quick things about that. Uh, I was in a little teeny town called Sassabee, Arizona a month or two ago, uh, which uh, is right on the Mexican border. And there you see this fence, which looks like an installation by Cristo. Uh, from, from where I was, it extended as far as the eye could see to the eastern horizon. To the western horizon, it stopped about a mile from where I was looking at it. And I asked the border patrol person that I was talking to, what's that about? Why does it stop there? And he said, oh, that's the Indian reservation. And uh, the Indians won't let us build there. They won't even let the border patrol vehicles come there. So there's a six to 10 mile hole in the fence. So what good does the fence do? All right, that, that's one thing. Another thing, this quickly. There's a terrific uh, little study by a sociologist at Princeton named Douglas Massey who uh, tries to quantify what have been the effects of tighter border security. And despite the six mile wide hole in the fence I just mentioned, the border has been sealed to an extent. So it's made the transaction cost of crossing the border higher. So people, Massey's conclusion is that the, the tighter border is in effect a check valve. That is to say, it hasn't seriously impeded migration into the country, but it has seriously impeded out migration back out of the country. So we've sealed the illegal population inside the vessel of the United States, and that's why the number of illegals has gone up pretty measurably in the last several years. We've got microphones on both aisles here. Just one point to follow on that. I mean, that, that is a, a serious problem because not only have the workers come to stay, but they used to go home. They've now brought their families as well. It's been increased demand to have their families come join them because of the difficulty uh, of going home. So you have had this perverse consequence of the enforcement strategy. Question here, sir. Sir, uh, I'm the chairman of uh, Iris Guard, a company that has deployed a homeland security system in the United Arab Emirates to track uh, deportees people who get expelled for violating the laws of the land, as simple as overstaying their visa. Uh, so far, this system has stopped over 320,000 people from returning after going to their home country, changing their name, issuing a new passport, and coming back with a new identity. How come the U.S. does not use such technology which has been proven elsewhere? Jack, no. <laughs> I'd be happy to sell it. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it's hard to say why they haven't started using it. I, I mean, it's similar, I think, to the U.S. visit program that we've got. The U.S. visit is uh, fingerprint-based. Right. Uh, with iris recognition, we're searching a million irises under two seconds, yeah. uh, which is far more effective than 10 fingerprints. Yeah, I know that the, the, bio, the, the biomedical information is something that is being considered and is being looked at uh, for the future. When we started this uh, program called Secure Traveler, which was a voluntary program that people could buy into, uh, part of the uh, biometrics they did use was the iris recognition, but that was purely private. It wasn't funded by the government. The government has not gone to that, as you say, and I can't tell you for sure why we haven't advanced that far yet. But, but in the Emirates, is, is this kind of data collected only about foreign nationals or about every resident? Uh, well, they started actually before September 11th. So this has been deployed over six years, uh, and, uh, or more actually. And uh, they have started with registering illegals that have been deported. Now they've expanded it. So they started registering residents who are foreigners staying in the United Arab Emirates. And ultimately, they want to register the whole population. Well, there I think you've put your finger on why this kind of approach is, is so, uh, people are so wary about it in this sure. country. But you can draw the line. I mean, you can say, I just want to do foreigners. I don't want to do residents. That's oh. yeah. One other answer is the return of people who have been previously deported through airports coming back from overseas is seen to be such a tiny problem of the million people or so who come across illegally over the southwest border. It's not to say it's not a significant problem, but, but almost all the enforcement resources have been put at the southwest border where the vast majority of undocumented migrants uh, come. Well, you know, we, we haven't discussed the issue of a very Overseas. significant part of, the, of where the illegals come from. They're here, they come to this country legally, and when their visa runs out, they just stay. Okay. And that's, I think, somewhere between a third and a half of all the illegals. And unless we address that, uh, all of the other elements of constraint are going to be uh, like the six-mile hole. Absolutely. That's right. Next question. 
Hi, uh, pardon the personal kind of nature of this question, but I'm a school teacher in Kansas, and we have a very large ESL program in our high school, uh, English, as first, uh, English as a Second Language. Very large, very successful program, but our local Board of Education has put a stipulation that if an ESL student does not complete the high school criteria in four years, which some of them take five years to complete, you know, some of the high school criteria based on language barriers. Um, the fact is they've worked really hard and they deserve that diploma. They are not recognized as, um, basically the diploma is not recognized towards the ESL graduation rate in our school. So they get the diploma, but it's not recognized within the ESL numbers. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my question in bringing that up, even though, you know, s very personal question here, is is there any advice that I, as a teacher, could bring to the board on, you know, the need for skilled laborers or anything else that maybe could pose an argument for that graduation? You know, I, I think this question gets at this whole issue of English becoming the, the primary language of the immigration population. Alex, I think you've done some thinking about this. I, I don't have a specific answer to help you there, but on, on, the, on the broader question, I've, there's been a real shift um, in, I think, among the advocacy groups um, about uh, English, where uh, um, for many years bilingual education was the main uh, mantra. I, I've noticed groups now talking about um, uh, the importance of teaching English, uh, teach immigrants English, and there's been a, a rough sort of back-of-the-envelope calculation that the, the number of hours needed to teach people who need to learn English who would legalize and then become citizens under the programs might be a billion hours of education. And actually, if there's an idea for, you know, to throw out to the, in the here, here we are in the Aspen Ideas Institute, I think it'd be a terrific program to think about a, a Teach for America program that would send graduates out into immigrant communities to teach people English, to try to cut into this billion hours of uh, English teaching, because we'll need this. And there's a real interest and need yeah in the immigrant communities now to learn English uh, in order to be able to take advantage of the coming legalization uh, programs. That's not, sorry, it's not specific, but it, it goes to the point that I think there, there is interest in learning English and we need to do a lot more on it. Thank you. You know, for all of his other problems, uh, Governor Blagojevich uh, actually took at, at least one, I think, kind of praiseworthy initiative. It was called the New Americans Initiative. And he secured money from the Illinois legislature, public money, to pay for uh, essentially not to put too fine a point on it, immigrant assimilation. It was public money paying for English language instruction, for naturalization classes, if that's what people wanted, for job finding, uh, job training skills, and so on and so forth. So, and the, the way he sold it politically, as I understand it, is he said that the, the, the immigrants amongst us are assets in a global economy. And if we don't uh, firmly stitch them into the fabric of our own society and use them as bridges too, the rest of the world, we're wasting an economic and social asset that we really ought to price very highly. So I, I think in a globalized economy, just worldwide speaking, uh, that's a pretty persuasive logic. Next question. Uh, my name is John Debs from Palo Alto. Uh, we employ and have employed a lot of mainly Mexican uh, individuals. And when I say to them, well, why do you come here? Well, we can earn so much money, more money here. It's a it's totally economic incentive. And I talked to one uh, fellow who said uh, there was an auto plant, uh, you know, close to where he lived in Mexico, but even there, it's $300 uh, a month in, in salary. So my question, I guess, to Dr. Greenspan is, maybe we need to think about putting some money into Mexico to basically make it less attractive uh, to come here. Yeah, the, the, the solution is not, as uh, Mexicans in government and other parts of society will tell you, foreign aid. What they need to do, and they're trying very, uh, I think, with extraordinary uh, barriers, they're trying to rebuild their economy, and they are making progress. Uh, if it weren't for the drug problems that have emerged recently and swine flu, which had a devastating effect on the Mexican economy, uh, they were showing signs and are showing signs of increasing the standards of living and therefore the levels of wages in uh, Mexico. Remember, some of the wage differences are huge, in like two to three times. And uh, ultimately, if that wage gap exists, 
I don't care how many fences you put up. I don't care how many inhibitions. People who are enterprising, who have a desire to make progress in their lives, will come north. And indeed, you know, uh, what we fail to realize is that people who actually migrate to this country, legally or otherwise, are the more active, thoughtful, uh, productive people in a society because they're coming out of a society which is not done all that well. And so we're getting the cream of the crop in a sense. And I think that's sad for both uh, those people who feel the need to run, but more importantly, Mexico itself, because it is critically important for us to have a viable Mexican economy. And the best way they can do it is by essentially moving forward on a number of things which, for example, Fernando de Soto was saying to my wife yesterday, namely, get a sense of a rule of law because there is where the weaknesses are and there is where most of the thoughtful people in Mexico believe the progress has got to be made. I also think that whoever the questioner went, we, my Palo Alto neighbor, uh, we also want to be a little careful of what we wish for. Uh, if we so, or the Mexicans managed so to stimulate their own economy that uh, there was no longer an incentive to migrate, and we were deprived uh, of all of that uh, augmentation of our own labor force, we would feel it uh, pretty sharply. And if any of you have ever seen the kind of whimsical but very, very pointed film, A Day Without Mexicans, uh, you'll see a, an illustration of what happens when the Mexican labor force takes the day off. I think that's, a, you know, that, that's an important point to be made. And I think the real question that uh, we in the United States have to de decide upon is what is the trade-off there? And from an economist's point of view, uh, I prefer that horrible event occurring rather than not. <laughs> Next question, please. Yeah, uh, Juan Salgado, I have a couple of perspectives. As a Mexican-American child of Mexican immigrants, as also an advisor to uh, Mexican President Felipe Calderon and a native of Chicago. So first of all, I want to assure everyone that Mexican-Americans Mexican immigrants will integrate into the society. This fear is a very unfounded fear, and it will largely depend upon the relative level of acceptance of people. The more you isolate a community, the harder it will be for them to integrate. And so it's more about what the U.S. society does than it is about what Mexican immigrants and their children will do. I have a nephew, child of an undocumented immigrant who's on a four-year scholarship to Stanford in the pre-engineering department. That's the kind of thing we need to be doing on a larger scale. Um, I think I, I, I was going to ask the question about economic development because ultimately I've been at the Ideas Festival, this is my second year, and I hear very little, very little. We talk about the economy and the world. As a session this morning with CEOs, we covered the whole world and then we got to Latin America, we stopped in Brazil. If it's anybody in that session, we stopped in Brazil, right? There was no speaking of Mexico. There was no speaking of Central America. Um, you know, when and how can we get to uh, a point where we understand the common interest? Just to finish on this point, right? Um, the drug situation is one that we have caused. This is the drug-consuming country. That is the drug producing country. We stop consumption, production begins to go down. Guns, those are United States guns. And so we have to have a more honest dialogue, right, about these issues in order to get to the source of them. And, um, and so I just want to uh, see if we can address the issue of when we can have the Iraq, Middle East type focus in terms of rebuilding um, on our neighbor, which would be the greatest national security thing we can do in some respects in terms of securing our southern border, to have a prosperous nation on the south. I couldn't agree more. Let me say that uh, uh, I know all of the senior economic advisors in the Mexican government. And they are as good as any in the world. And I've had conversations with President Calderon, and he is 
holding the view that you hold, and I think is effectively maintaining it and carrying the issue forward because, frankly, uh, some of the arguments we make in the United States in opposition to that, uh, I, don't, I think are pretty flimsy. Well, we do have the North American Free Trade Agreement, after all, which was an attempt to create a framework that would facilitate the kind of Mexican economic development you just mentioned. And I, I dare say, in my perception at least, in the first year of the George W. Bush administration, uh, Mexico was becoming a central focus of foreign policy, and that all got dislodged after 9-11. Uh, after so, sir? Uh, one aspect of our broken immigration system that this panel has not touched on is the uh, deportation process. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of people, maybe millions, uh, who are being held in INS facilities for months, sometimes years, uh, waiting for their cases to be called. Uh, many of them don't have lawyers. They can't afford lawyers. The immigration judges are, many of them, subpar. Um, in addition to, you have teenagers in this country who are not citizens, who have been uh, uh, pleading guilty uh, to minor offenses and are being subjected to deportation to uh, countries they've never really lived in. Their lawyers have not advised them of the consequences of their pleas. Um, it's, it's a mess. And what does this panel suggest to fix all this? Well, let me say a word about that. The, uh, in 1996, Congress passed legislation that was called the Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty Act. And it had a provision on immigration, so you can tell which way it was going on this. Uh, <laughs> And it, it took the opportunity to put into law a number of really unfortunate provisions that go to your questions. It cut out a lot of judicial review. It dramatically expanded the deportation grounds for minor offenses. It made some of them retroactive. Uh, and so you have people now being removed for really very, for, for minor, uh, minor criminal offenses. And many of them spend many months in detention. Under the immigration law, you're allowed to bring a lawyer with you if you have one, but you're not entitled to counsel. And that, that seems to me, in many cases, should be seen as a due process violation. You have people who don't understand the system, don't speak the language with dramatic consequences, and any, any kind of due process balance, it would seem a lawyer would be very helpful in that, in that situation. So there were attempts in early years, was called was a Fix 96, there was an attempt to change the law. It has not been a significant part of the current debate on comprehensive immigration reform, but it needs to get back into the system because the system just went much too far in one direction. And uh, the, the law became very draconian in a way that really is not, uh, is not American. There, there are many people whose voices are not really being heard who are, who are being you know, victimized by, the, by, those, by that provision. Yeah. You know, there's another element of this, Alex, you undoubtedly know more about it, but there, there's a significant population in the federal prison system of uh, immigrants, legal or illegal, whatever, who've been convicted of crimes and whose countries of origin won't take them back. And other things being equal, we'd love to send them back home again, but they won't, they're not accepted. So we, we're supporting, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's a significant number of people. Some of them have been been held for years yeah, because there there's no country that will take them back. No. Yeah. The numbers like that. There are also about, I think, about seven or 8,000 uh, unaccompanied minors in de federal detention, in immigration detention. It was just an effort launched with the support of Microsoft and other corporations to provide legal representation across the country. The goal is to give all these people legal representation. It's called KIND, Kids in uh, Need of Defense. Um, but, but that's really the most dramatic example of both the detention issue and the representation issue. We have time for one last question. Please make it brief. I'm Laddie Kaur from Phoenix, and I, in the spirit of the Ideas Festival, I have a political suggestion for bringing this issue back on the table. And it's to put a face on 40,000 young people who came to this country when they were very young, mostly Mexican, who have done everything we've asked of them, including completing high school. Many of them have already completed college and have no prayer of getting the documents that would enable them, even when they've completed law school, to, to practice their trade or take their skills into this country. Legislation, which tragically got sidetracked a year ago called the DREAM Act, would set a very significant kind of set of requirements for these young people to enter the green card process and I would hope the DREAM Act itself would be revived 
But putting a face of these young people into the conversation, I can tell you I've seen it happen in Arizona, and I believe it could be quite valuable on the national stage. Yeah, and this, the, the DREAM Act is on the... It, it's regularly mentioned that there's a, a tricky aspect to the politics of this. There's some fear that if you pass smaller bits of legislation, you will then undercut the overall political movement towards comprehensive immigration reform. So the, the inside the Beltway guys haven't quite figured out whether they're going to press for the DREAM Act as opposed to the comprehensive reform or not. But the, the bill has been introduced a number of times, and it ought to be passed. I agree with you or not. So our time is up. I want to thank our panelists, David, Alan, Alex, for a stimulating conversation.